like to, and you can turn to chapter number 5, and we'll be there in just a minute. But I just want to say to you this morning, one of my favorite phrases, Merry Christmas. <laughs> say it with me, Merry Christmas. Christmas. All right, thank you, very good. We can say that. I love that phrase. We were, Maddie and I were in, I forget where we're all oh, Staples. Thank you, we were in Staples and uh, picking up some uh, holiday cards. Huh. Anyways, and the, the young lady says, Happy Holidays, and Maddie says, Merry Christmas. <laughs> I thought she was going to have a meltdown right there, because anyway, she's like, it's, she asked me, she said, Daddy, why is it so hard? It's Christmas. Why is it so hard just to say those words, Merry Christmas? I don't know, but I do love this time of year, because it's the only time of year, not the only time of year, but well, I, actually, I guess it is the only time of year, when we as Christians have an open license to talk about the Lord. And guess what? People don't get as offended by it whenever you talk about Jesus around Christmas. You ever wonder why that is? It's because even people who want to wish happy holidays, people that want to give out holiday cards, have holiday parties, watch holiday movies, eat holiday cookies, and put up holiday trees, even they have to admit that Jesus is the central focus and reason and purpose behind this season and time of year that we're in. It's all about Him. So I'm excited. I get to take a break from preaching on Romans. I get to preach on my favorite topic. I want to preach on Jesus for the next few weeks. If that bothers you, I'm sorry. But that's just what you get when you come to Grace Baptist Church. We uplift Jesus Christ. He is central here. So I'm thankful for you being here. And if that bothers you, I really hope it would. I hope you'll stay. And I hope you'll ask yourself, why does it bother me whenever a pastor is talking about Jesus so much? So I'm going to take a break. And I'm going to preach on Jesus, okay? Do you have any idea how much of the Bible is about Jesus? Every bit of it. All of it. Yeah. All of it. He is in literally every single Amen. book of the Bible. Everywhere. Beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse number 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and the Spirit of God moved on the face. It's all about Jesus, Him speaking. He's in the Old Testament, the New Testament. He's in the Psalms, the Proverbs. He's in everywhere. It's all about Him from the beginning to the end and the middle. Everything is about Him. I was blown away. I knew that. I've got a, a bachelor's degree in theology. And I'm looking, uh, uh, preparing for this message, and I said, I'm just curious. I uh, turned on my computer program, and I opened up Names Topical Index on my computer. I like that better as I, rather than taking my entire library with me. I just take my computer, and i got all these books on there, so it helps me out a lot. But I typed in, opened up Names Topical Index of the Bible, and I typed in the word Jesus just to see how much of the Bible is about Jesus. All of it. Page after 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 page of nothing but verses about Jesus Christ. Old Testament, New Testament, everywhere. It's all about Him. Alright. So that's what we're going to look at. Now, I want to talk about this morning prophecies concerning His birth. And then, if you'll bear with me next week, I want to talk about or preach on the proclamations of His birth. And if you will bear with me and be extremely patient and come back on the 22nd, I want to preach on the purpose of His birth. So that's the three messages that we're going to have here leading up to the Christmas season. But this morning, we are going to talk about the birth of Jesus Christ and the prophecies concerning His birth. So let me ask, I, always like, I like to ask questions. People asking questions has never bothered me. And I like to ask questions whenever I'm studying the Bible. And I ask myself this question, if I'm going to preach on prophecies, what questions would I want answered? If I was a skeptic, and by the way, I don't know if I told you or not, but by nature, I'm a skeptical person. I'm a, Mel, Mel will tell you this, I'm skeptical of everything. Whenever I hear or read something new, I don't just jump on it. I was like, mm-hmm. Uh, okay, let me just watch this for a couple weeks. I'm still watching Kanye West. I hope it's true. I hope that Jesus, I know Jesus Christ can save him. And I hope, and I know Jesus Christ wants to save him. And I'm really hoping and praying and watching that he really did get saved. I'm really hoping that with all my heart. I'm hoping that, but I'm still watching him. I'm still a bit skeptical of him. And if I'm wrong, God forgive me. So I ask myself a question, you know, what does the Bible say about the birth of Jesus? What questions would I want answered? So these are the three questions that I came up with and I'm going to answer. What does the Bible say about the birth of Jesus? First of all, the Bible tells us, listen to me, tells us exactly where Jesus would be right. born. Sure the Bible actually tells us almost to the day when Jesus would be born. I would prove that to you, but I'm not good with math. 
But anyways, Daniel tells us exactly when he'll be born. But I want to turn to the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse number 2, if you have it. Amen. Right there. It tells us exactly where Jesus will be born. He says this, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall, come, shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Let's think about this and let's pray. Lord, would you please help me this morning? I don't want to be in a hurry. I don't want to rush through this, but I want to preach this. I'm excited. I just pray, God, that you'd help me to be clear in when I speak and what I'm speaking on. I believe this word to be true. I believe everything that you said about your son being born is true. And I pray, God, that that will convey that through the message today in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible tells us exactly where he would be born. Exactly where he would be born. Micah 5, number 2 tells us that he was born in Bethlehem. All right? David was born in Bethlehem. David is the greatest king that Israel ever knew. David was his club. He was a type of Jesus Christ. He was a godly man, loved the Lord, served the Lord, lived for the Lord, did a lot of things that were wrong, but did mostly what was right. And whenever he would do something that was wrong, he would correct it and ask for forgiveness. And he would uh, receive that forgiveness because that's who God is. But David was born in Bethlehem, and guess what? His greatest descendant was also born in Bethlehem. Amen. That was Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I want to talk a little bit about this. I want to point out to you that Jesus may have been David's son. He was the son of David. You read in the Bible, you read through the Gospels, and you'll see over and over again, they call him son of David, thou son of David. Speaking of his right, right to the heir of the throne, he was the son of David. He may have been David's son, but I want you to know something, that he actually predates David. If you look in Revelation chapter 5, verse number 5, sometime on your own, don't turn there now, but sometime on your own, it calls him the Lion of the tribe of Judah and the Root of David. The Root of David. Now David's son, to be David's son, that means you have to be the fruit of that tree. So if we picture David as a tree, we see the branch, we see the trunk, the branch, the leaves, and the fruit. Jesus Christ was the fruit of David. He came from the line of David. But the Bible tells, and that's a true statement, by the way, the Bible also tells us that he was the root of David. So that tree that David was a part of, guess what? Jesus Christ was holding it up. Jesus Christ came before the tree, came before David. He was the root of David. There would be no David without Jesus Christ. Somebody could say, well, there would be no Jesus Christ without David. I was like, you tell that to God. You tell that to God. I want you to know something. That God could have raised Jesus Christ out of anybody's line. He could have picked anybody in the nation of Israel out of any tribe he wanted to. But he chose Judah. And he chose David. And through David and through Judah came the Savior. You tell that to God. There would have been no David without Jesus Christ. David was born. I want you to understand something. David was born and he was chosen to be king by God. So that one day God would send forth his son through him that would be the king. I'm uh, not Israel, but the king of the universe, the king of the world. God promised David. He made a promise to David. He said, David, there will never fail an heir to sit on your throne. Amen. Never will there be anyone who will not be worthy to sit on your throne. Now, there, were a, there was a span of time where nobody could do it. But whenever Jesus Christ came on the scene, they called him son of David. He was the rightful heir to the throne of, the, uh, throne of David. Why would God make that promise to David? Well, because God knew that one day his son would be born. He knew that one day Jesus Christ would be born and he would be the heir. He knew that, that one day in the city of David, God himself would become a man whenever Jesus Christ was born. God knew that one day, he, God rather knew what he was going to do before he ever spoke David into existence, knew what he was going to do. So I want you to remember something this morning. No matter what you're struggling with, no matter what you're doubting, no matter what your, uh, your troubles are today, whenever your life gets bad, I want you to remember three things. Number one, God knows what he's doing. Yep. You don't. You don't have a clue because you can't see the whole picture, but God can. God knows what he's doing. You can't see, you can't know, but God knows. So don't lose hope. Trust in him. And let me tell you something. The third thing you need to do, once you remember that God knows what he's doing, once you remember that you can't and you're not supposed to, don't forget those two. God knows what he's doing. Just trust him. Those are the three things you should do. Just trust God. Believe God. Understand your limitations and trust God. That's the three things you should do. So that's the prophecy concerning where he'd be born. Now let's talk about this. That's wonderful. There is a prophecy that said when he would be born. Now wouldn't it be something if there was no fulfillment of that? Now turn to Luke chapter number 2. Luke 2 this morning. 
Luke chapter 2. Let's look at the fulfillment of this prophecy. Uh, Luke number 2, verses 1 through 7 says this, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus. If you're in the habit of underlining or highlighting in your Bible, underline that phrase where it said a decree from Caesar Augustus. That the whole world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. Underline that phrase, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, into the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. You might want to underline that too. Just underline Joseph and Bethlehem. Why? Because he was of the house and lineage of David. Number five, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. Underline that phrase, being great with child. You know what that means? Let me put it in the way we would say it. She was ready to pop. Amen? Y'all ever been there, ladies? Been ready to pop? All right. There we go. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be uh, delivered. Don't underline verse 6. Maybe just put a star beside of verse number 6 because that's important. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And if y'all want to see one of the best innkeepers in the history of innkeepers, come out next night, next Sunday night at 6 o'clock and see Miss Susan here. She makes a fantastic innkeeper. All right. Now, Galatians 4 and verse number 4. I love this verse too. I just read it as our, um, our verse at the beginning of the service. But I want to read it again. You're welcome to turn there if you want to. If not, you can just listen to me. Maybe write it down and look at it on your own. Galatians chapter 4 and verse number 4 says this. It says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law. That first part, part of that phrase, when the fullness of time was come. These two verses, these two passages go hand in hand. Luke chapter uh, uh, 2 and Galatians 4 go hand in hand together. Let's talk about that phrase in, uh, in Galatians. When the fullness of time was come. I want you to understand something about the timing of when God sent forth His Son. It wasn't in Egypt under the rule of Pharaoh that God sent Jesus into the world. It wasn't, in his, it wasn't in his kingdom. It wasn't in his day. It wasn't under the rule of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon that God chose to send forth his son into the world to redeem the world from their sins. It wasn't even under the rule of Xerxes or Cyrus or even during the rule of Alexander the Great, these great kings and great conquerors. It wasn't under their rule. And these men had control of the known world. It wasn't under their rule that God sent forth his son. I want you to see and understand this morning that it was under the rule of the Roman emperor that God said, this is it. This is the time. The time is right. I'm going to send my son into the world to save mankind from their sins. So we ask, why in the world would God choose this time to send his son into the world? Well, let me tell you something. And during the Roman Empire, there were paved roads all over the Roman Empire. Empire. You ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to Rome? <clears throat> That's because the Roman Empire were the only people paving roads. All right, if you were on a paved road, you turn it, depending on which direction you were going, you could turn around and go right back to Rome because that's where they all started. It made it easier for them to conquer the whole world because guess what? They didn't have to cut across country. They had paved roads that they could take their army and their soldiers across and they could invade countries that much more quickly. Uh, at a time, by the way, what's important about the roads, not only did it make it easier for them to invade uh, other countries, but it also made travel easier. I want you to understand that. It made travel easier so that there would be people who would be followed followers of God who would be going all over the world, going to Jerusalem to keep the Passover and all the various feasts that they had to keep, would have made it easier on them. That's important when you come to the book of Acts in chapter number 2. On the day of Pentecost, whenever Peter preaches and all those people were in Jerusalem and they heard the gospel and trusted Christ. I want you to understand that God sent forth his son at a time when it would have been the easiest for the spread of the gospel to move quickly. And the good news that Jesus Christ had been born at a time whenever all of that was easiest is when God chose to send forth his son. By the way, how did he do it? He did it at the bequest of the Roman emperor. It says in chapter 2, verse number 1, that Caesar, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Uh, that census, by the way, it, it, it may have been given by Augustus, but it was ordained by God. Amen. You understand that? That he didn't just wake up one day and say, hey, guess what? I think it would be a great time for a census. No, God said, hey, listen, buddy, you're going to call a census and you're going to get everybody up from wherever they're living now and they're going to go to the place of their birth. Be like God calling uh, a census for Melly and I to get up and she's in my household and we live in Random and we'd have to go to the place of birth. We'd have to get up and come to Greensboro because guess where I was born? Moses H. Cone Memorial Hospital. Amen. I'd have to go there and give an account. I'm here. 
It's the place of my birth. Let me uh, register wherever i got to register. All right. Um, hang on a second here. So they had to get up and they had to go to the place of their birth, the land of their nativity, where their family was come. It was ordained by God before the world was ever even spoken into existence. All right, let me give you some more other help here this morning. Uh, I want you to understand something that um, Mary and Joseph, they had no intentions whatsoever of going to Bethlehem. No, sir. No, ma'am. You will not convince me that they said, hey, Joseph married being nine months and several weeks pregnant. Joseph would be sure would be nice to get on a donkey and ride across country and go down to Bethlehem just to see what's going on. Mm -mm. Now, I've never been pregnant. I know that's a shock. <laughs> I have never experienced childbirth firsthand, but I have secondhand through my wife and our two beautiful daughters. I've experienced that, and I can, I can testify to this, and honey, you feel free to say amen if this is true, and you other ladies too. Whenever she was nine months and several weeks pregnant, going across country in a car wasn't part of our plans. It was a great feat to get from the bed to the couch. Amen? Amen. Thank you. All right. They had no intentions of going to Bethlehem, but I want you to know something. She had a divine appointment that had to be kept. That's right. All right. She, God said, you don't want to go to Bethlehem. You won't go to Bethlehem. But I guess what I've said, that my son will be born in Bethlehem. So, Mary, get ready to go to Bethlehem. Uh-uh. Oh, yeah? Well, here comes the Roman governor knocking on the door. If you don't go to Bethlehem, you don't go to the name. He's just going to arrest you and take everything you got. Okay, we're going to Bethlehem. So, God used the census to get them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Why? So that his word would be fulfilled. Amen? Isn't that great? God made a promise to his servant David that he would have an heir to sit on his throne. And that he, that heir would be born in Bethlehem. And God always keeps his word. Amen. I'm thankful for that this morning. Let, the, uh, let that be a comfort to you today. Let me ask you, has God promised you something? You read his word and you find promises that God has promised that God has promised to you. Now, we can't claim all the promises. Some of them are strictly for Israel. But most of those promises we can claim and apply for ourselves, right? Isn't that good to know that whenever God makes a promise to you, He keeps it. Amen. He wants yeah. to keep it. He's thrilled to keep it. And it's so good. That's who He is. That He's going to keep it. Today, He's promising to save any sinner that will turn to Him in faith. And that promise is just as good as His promises to David and the prophecy, prophecy given to Micah. Now, the Bible is perfect. It perfectly prophesied where Jesus would be born. And it gets even better than that because it also tells us exactly how he would be born. If you're in the Old Testament, go to uh, the book of Isaiah, chapter number 7. You know exactly where I'm going with this. Isaiah, chapter 7, and verse number 14. Amen. Says this. says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a son. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. A virgin shall conceive. Oh boy, I'm not going to give you a biology lesson this morning. Suffice it to say, that's not how it works. Okay, that's unheard of. That's not, it's not talking about a virgin, someone who has never had a, a, a physical relationship with a man is going to have a physical relationship and conceive. That's not what it's talking about. The Bible, the wording of this is this. And by the way, it doesn't mean a young woman. It means a virgin. A young virgin is going to, is going to conceive. It means that she is going to conceive without any outside help from any man. No, this is going to be a divine appointment. God is going to do something right here. Impossible, you say. Exactly, I say, because that's what the Bible says. It is impossible. But that's what God does. He's the God of the impossible. Amen. I want you to imagine for a minute, if God only ever did what was possible. Have you ever thought about that? We say, well, that's impossible. Not for God. With God, all things are possible. What if God only did what was possible? Not much of a God, is He? If God only did what was possible, then God would only do what we could do for ourselves. But God does the impossible because that's who He is. And God said, listen, a virgin's going to conceive. She's going to have a child. She's going to have, specifically, she's going to have my child. How do you know it's God's child? He said, because that's what we're going to call, we're going to call Him Emmanuel. The word means God with us. She's going to have my child. Not like the Mormons teach, where God actually came down and had a physical relationship with her. No. You go back and read the uh, gospel accounts where the power, the, uh, the Holy Spirit overshadowed her and the power of God came upon her and planted the seed in her womb. 
That's what the Bible says. Let me ask you a question this morning. Is anything too hard for God? No. 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 Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too hard for my God. Let me tell you something. I don't know what you're facing this morning, but there's not a sea that you can't cross over on dry ground whenever you put your faith in God. There is not a wall that will stand before you that will not be called to come down flat whenever you put your faith in God. I want you to know this morning, there's not a furnace that can burn you up whenever you put your faith and trust in God. I want you to know there's not a den of lions that cannot be tamed whenever you put your faith and trust in God. God is the God of the impossible. Possible. He does every single day what we cannot do. Prove it, preacher. Is the earth still spinning? How many of you got out there and gave it a push? <laughs> God does the impossible. Amen. What do we do? What's our part in this? Nothing. Just get out of his way and let him do it. Right. Let him have his way and give him the glory when he does it. Yeah. Amen. All right, a virgin. Could you imagine Joseph's reaction? <laughs> Mary will say, hey Joseph, how you doing? I'm doing good. Mary, you're looking good today. Well, thank you. I'm pregnant. What? <laughs> but you're engaged to me. How can you be pregnant? You're engaged to me. You're supposed to be a virgin. I am. What? <laughs> well, look, Mary, I don't, I'm not a smart man, but I know that ain't how it works, all right? Virgins don't just go around getting pregnant. <laughs> all right? That ain't how it works. They said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. An angel came to me. <laughs> She's crazy. <laughs> now I'm just I'm thinking about this from my perspective, our perspective. What would you think? Yeah, You're a virgin who's pregnant, and an angel told you, "Okay, <laughs> find a way to get rid of this marriage. <laughs> get her out." <laughs> oh man, this whole arranged marriage thing ain't working out. Okay. <laughs> She's a few fries short, a few fries short of a happy meal here. <laughs> okay. But then God sends an angel to Joseph. Now Mary ain't crazy anymore. Yeah. Joseph knows he ain't crazy too. Yeah. But he gets confirmation that he says, Don't put them away. Don't put her away. The child that's within her is of the holy. Okay. All right. You imagine the responsibility, Joseph. Now I've got to raise the son of God. <laughs> no wonder he died early. <laughs> Say it. That's our God. Man. He does the impossible. Yes. He's doing just what he said he would do. So the Bible tells us where he'd be born in my, in my, Matthew. I'm sorry, Micah, chapter five, verse number two, in Bethlehem. It tells us how he would be born of a virgin. But most importantly. The Bible tells us, and don't miss this, the Bible tells us exactly who would be born. Yeah. That's important right there. Isaiah chapter uh, 7, verse number 14 again says this, A virgin shall conceive and shall bring forth a son, <clears throat> and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. I hope I got that right because I lost my place. Yep. Yeah. Um, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear a son, and shall call his name, hey, I got it right, and shall call his name Emmanuel. So it tells us that the virgin's child would be called Emmanuel, of course, meaning God with us. Now that's pretty simple right there. God with us is what that, is who that child is going to be. Now turn to Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6. It's just one page over usually. Uh, it says this in verse uh, chapter 9, verse number 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. You know, stuff like that happens every day. There's children born every day. There's sons given every single day. And if it stopped right there, this would be just an ordinary verse, but it goes on. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, speaking about how he will rule as a sovereign. And <clears throat> he shall be called Wonderful. Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Verse number 7. Of the increase of His government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon His kingdom to order it and to establish it with just, uh, judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. I want you to see this child mentioned tells us in, in chapter 9 verse number 6 tells us that he would have the same nature and attributes of God. He's eternal. He's from everlasting. He's the mighty God. There's no question whatsoever that Isaiah's two prophecies concerning the birth would be God. He would be born. Okay, now the question is, well, who's he talking about here? He has to be, listen to me, has to be talking about Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew. If you would bear with me and turn to Matthew chapter 1, verse number 23, where it says this. It says, Behold, this is just a uh, fulfillment 
of the prophecy, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, which being interpreted is God with us. Back up to verse number uh, 21. And <clears throat> this is the angel coming to Joseph, whatever. And it says, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. In that passage, the context of that passage, the angel comes to Joseph. Joseph is engaged to Mary. And the angel says to Joseph, Mary is with child. She's a virgin. Marry her. She's a good woman. She is worthy to be married. But she was also, also found worthy to bear the Son of God. Joseph, your wife is going to give birth to the Messiah. Speaking about none other than Jesus Christ. None other than Jesus Christ. What about John chapter 14 and verse number 14? Uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 1, verse number 14. I had the wrong reference here. John chapter 1 says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse number, that's speaking about Jesus, talking about His, his existence from the past and for all eternity. And then you skip down to verse number 14, says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. I'm going to tell you something. When Isaiah prophesied in 7.14 and in 9.6, whenever he prophesied, he was talking about Jesus Christ. His birth in Bethlehem is no mistake. It's no accident. It's no chance that he, had, he was born there. Everything points to the birth of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Son of David. You know, there's much to that debate today over who Jesus is. Let's just let the Bible settle it for us. Jesus Christ is God. Amen. That's the bedrock of our faith right there. The Bible plainly predicted where Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, just like the Bible said. The birthplace in the city of David. The Bible tells us how he'd be born, miraculously conceived by a virgin. And the Bible tells us and ends the debate on just who Jesus is. Jesus is God. I will go to my grave believing that. Amen. And one day I'll be resurrected, still believing it, still Amen. shouting on my way to heaven to be with my God. Because guess what? He is God yeah. and He is worthy, yeah. alright? So tell me again, all these prophecies predicted by Micah, by Isaiah, and there's many others. All these prophecies predicted by them completely fulfill exactly the way that God said they would be. Tell me again how the Bible is inaccurate and untrustworthy and unreliable. Tell me again. You can't do that. You know why? Because it's not. You can believe it. Let me tell you something. I want to call your attention to the following facts. Fact number one. If the Bible is reliable and accurate concerning its predictions of the birth of Jesus Christ, which it is, as we've proven in this message, then the Bible must be correct and accurate concerning everything it says. Or else it's not authoritative. Secondly, if the Bible is right on the claims of Jesus' birth, where he would be born, how he would be born, and who would be born, if it's accurate on those claims, then it must, be all, it must also be accurate on its claims, on all claims, everything it says, such as the fact that all men are sinners. And there's some people today that say, I'm a pretty good person, I'm not a sinner, I'm not a bad person. Well, that's not what the Bible teaches and if the Bible is right about Jesus Christ being who He was, being born where He was, let me tell you, the Bible is right when it tells you that you're a sinner and need of forgiveness. Let me give you another one. If the Bible is correct about Jesus and correct about all men being sinners, then in us, it must also be correct whenever the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the Savior of all sinners. The Bible must also be correct that whenever it's that, that where, when it says that when, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It must be accurate in that statement as well. I tell you what, if you don't get anything else out of this message, I want you to understand this. The Bible is accurate. This is the most reliable source of information on the face of this earth. Amen. It's, been, it's, it's gone through the test of the times. It's been attacked from the very beginning. It's been attacked for centuries. It's been attacked by people, by good people, by bad people. It's been attacked for all these centuries. But it still is here. And it still says the same thing. You cannot deny that Jesus Christ is God. You cannot deny that He was born of a virgin. You cannot deny that He was born exactly where and when God said He would be born. You cannot deny those facts. 
You cannot deny these facts. And let me tell you something. You cannot deny the fact that we're all sinners either. Amen. And you cannot deny the fact that Jesus Christ came to save us. And you cannot deny the fact that without Him you will die and spend eternity in hell. And it will not be His fault. It will be your fault. Right. Because today you are... But you have no excuse. You've heard the truth. You've heard the gospel. And whatever you do today will decide and determine where you spend eternity. Okay? You, the fact is this. You must do something with what you have heard this morning. And if you don't, it's on you. Okay? Here's a question for you. And we'll close with this. What are you going to do with what you've heard this morning? Let's bow our heads.